Thanks, Alexis. I'm really excited to be here with you and Dan today to discuss this topic and look forward to answering questions about it. But let's start with the biggest question, which is why is it a problem if sales doesn't use your content? The short answer is you spend a lot of time investigating your audience, tailoring your message, and composing all of this, car all of this content for marketing. You on your own or within your department can use it to generate leads. But with all this investment, you don't want it to dead end there. It's not good for you, and it's not good for the lead who accessed the content and expects to hear more about the problem and ultimately about how your problem, how your company has the solution. It's not uncommon for marketers to bring in leads with a specific campaign, only to have salespeople follow up generally outside of the general campaign slant and push their own end goal. Could be a trial, a demo, or other similar hurdles. And this is compounded and it gets even worse for prospects out there who are doing their own searching as it can be very tough to find relevant information on the internet, which means they won't even get to hear about your solution to their problem. And this is the crux of the problem. Google's chairman, Eric Schmidt, summed it up by saying, quote, every two days more content is now created than what existed in the history of man up until 2003. That's an amazing amount of content. And judging by recent Gartner survey findings, which cited that nearly half of all marketers now say content creation and curation is their most important role, the amount of content will only continue to grow. And this content comes in all forms. We're all familiar with it. The videos we create, the websites we modify, the blogs we write, the tweets we compose, the ebooks we put out on landing pages, the webinars like this one, all of it. All of it is, is creating more and more content to access. And the problem is that it's stored in all kinds of areas. YouTube, shared drives, Dropbox, Google Drive, your corporate website, the internet, the intranet. I mean, it could be anywhere, even in your email. And all of this content across all these areas is tough to keep track of. And if you're not sure, if you as the marketer are not sure where everything is, how will your salespeople ever stand a, ever stand a chance? And this is just the baseline. The next step after you organize your content so everybody knows where it's at is letting them know how to use it. And luckily, we'll discuss best practices for this later today. But empowering your company to share your content with prospects so that the prospects receive the content that is most relevant to them is one of the best things you can do with your content. And while we're all adrift in the content sea, the good news out there is that the good news out of this change is that clients and prospects really do want to access and read your content when it is relevant to them. And that's the key term is the relevance. But they struggle to find the right information that is most relevant to them at any particular moment. We talked about this content C. How are they going to find it? How are they going to come across it? How are they even going to know how it applies to them? Well, the good news is that there's a great way to do this, and it's by aligning with your sales team so that they can lead the way for the prospect and give them personalized content in a tailored way. You have an entire army of salespeople at your disposal. They just need to be trained and enabled on how to use your content with the content in context. And if you can do this well, you'll have great sales and marketing alignment and be on your way to generating more revenue. As recent HubSpot research sites, companies with good sales and marketing alignment generate 20% more revenue than those that are not well aligned. And that's what we're going to teach here today, how you can use content and context to better train and align with your sales team and prospects. So with this in mind, I'll turn it over to Dan, who will begin our discussion on how to solve the problem of too much content that is not sales enabled. So what we did is we started with an audit. We drew up a, a map of our sales stages, including all of the stages that we were tracking before MQL. And we mapped out our buyer personas and we began to map out which assets we had to address each combination of buyer and sales stage. When we factored in aging, we ended up with a heat map showing us where we were strong and where we were weak. And this audit led to our ability to create a content strategy, something we never could have had without the audit. We were able to look at our gaps, identify which were the most important to our sales efforts, and then determine what would be the most effective content for those areas. And from there, 
we communicated the audit and strategy back to the sales team. Again, this map hadn't existed before, so while people had an intuition of what existed and what didn't, they didn't have a real clear sense of, of inventory. Material had built up over time, and we really needed to re-familiarize the sales team with the content that existed. And it was also an opportunity to validate that sales was using the right tools for the right time. We, in fact, found that sometimes people were using something that was targeting one persona to a different one, something that was meant for a late sales stage cycle uh, early in the deal pipeline. So sales can really intuit when you don't have a plan. And so reorienting them got them back in sync with our marketing team and our, car, uh, and our content strategy and plan. So Great. Sean, I'll turn it over to you to talk about those personas I mentioned that we, we worked on. That's great, Dan. Thank you very much. And, and so as you said, now we have this plan. We know where the content's located. You've identified gaps. We're ready to figure out the next step. And so it's an awesome foundation. Uh, now we just need to make sure the content you will continue to use and the content you are going to develop is catered to the right person. I could do an entire webinar on product market fit, but for the purposes of this webinar, I'm going to assume you know roughly who your ideal buyer is. The ultimate decider could be, for example, the vice president of HR, the head of product, or the CFO. You know who you're targeting, and now you need to develop a buyer persona, which will serve as the base for all of your marketing content. A buyer persona will answer questions that will help you prepare your content for the target audience, and will also do the most important thing you can do after the development of your content. It will enable you and your sales team to put it in context. We'll talk a little bit more about the context part later, but for now, how do you develop a buyer persona? With these four steps. Number one, let's start with the basics. You have a lot of information in the analytics of your website and your marketing system. You can go through Google Analytics if you're a HubSpot, Pardot, uh, Eloqua user, Marketo user. Analyze it. How are people accessing your site? How are they finding it? What are they searching for? What are the terms they're using to wind up there? And what are they doing once they get there? Use this information and more to identify and follow what we, look, we at Postwire like to call tracer bullets. Those are things that seem to be repetitive and interesting. And once you figure that out, you're going to go on to step two. So after you discover the basics, it's time to get a little bit more detailed. You know broadly who your target is. Now let's dig in. What problems do they commonly have? What will push them to solve these problems? Where do they access information? How do they access it? And what types of information are they seeking? Answer as many of these questions and hopefully more as possible, and you'll start to get a picture of your persona. And then it's time to investigate. So how do you validate this? You have an idea of your who your persona is, who your ideal buyer is. How do you go out and test it? The simple way is just ask. As many, ask as many people within the persona that you're theorizing as possible and look for consistencies. Does your solution solve a problem? Where would these people look for if they were looking for solutions to their problem? Where do they generally hang out online? Who do they look for, to re for recommendations? Where do they do their research? All of these questions have, will, will contain answers that will have you spiraling towards the middle of your answer. And so then we go to the final part. That is the final part before you continue to iterate and improve. Forming your persona. So you use all the information you've gathered to put together this fictional person. This person is an aggregation of the problems that you've identified, where they seek solutions, who might influence them, what motivates them, all of this type of information that you've gathered, that you've asked and tested with them. Then this is the information that you're going to use to tailor your content. And don't forget to keep sales in the loop while you're doing this. Not only will they help in the crafting of the buyer persona, but they'll also know how and where to use the new content in the sales cycle, or at least be able to give you a great clue as to where it might fit well. And Dan's going to speak more on this topic. All right, thank you, Sean. So the worst organizations I've been in are when marketing thinks, you know, sales really doesn't know what's good for them. And sales thinks, well, marketing really has no idea what works in the real world. 
Sales are particularly transactional. and in, in fact, one of my former sales leaders said uh, they're actually coin operated. So once they find something that works, they're going to continue to use it. And what I've found is that when it comes to content, sales are squirrels, right? Um, they will work with what they're used to until they can see something new works. For that reason, you need to spend time with them to continually reinforce what the new assets are and why, why some assets are being retired and not considered affection, uh, effectual, and provide them the, the, the information that's going to help them buy into the new content. I mean, the ultimate trick is really to get them to believe that the new content was their idea. And if you can do that, then you're going to get them engaged in, and feeling that the new content is exactly what they need to help them drive sales. Sean? Thanks, Dan. And, and so one of the most common problems I see in improving this dynamic in, in between the sales and marketing alignment is this. Marketing creates tons of content, uh, content in many forms like we talked about, infographics, webinars like this one you're sitting on, you know, even presentations, videos, um, e-books, blog posts, tons and tons of stuff. And this content is typically housed, like we talked about, in many different locations. And oftentimes the problem is uh, the only, the best tool at uniting all of this is, is some kind of a spreadsheet that's rarely updated. And we start these organizational tools like the spreadsheets with the best of intentions. Sure, we're going to list every single piece of content we have. We're going to map it to the buyer need. And yeah, we're definitely going to keep this updated. And, and sales is always going to go here. They're always going to look for this, for the solution. Um, but we all know what kind of happens. Soon we realize that, that we don't do the best job of keeping this updated. Sales decides not to reference it. Uh, and the information death spiral of all your content begins. So soon it's not just a spreadsheet that's out of date, but the content too. And we joked in the invite to this webinar that there's a classic line that, that probably makes every single marketer cringe, which is, where's the most recent brochure? And that's because you know, even though you're a content marketing rock star, you're creating all of this content, you're housing it exactly where it should be, and you know how to access it. If you're not enabling your sales team to easily locate, personalize, and share this information, and, and keeping close to them as Dan's discussed, they're going to continue to use the same old stuff. So it's important to involve them, as Dan was talking about, in the creation of this map. Great place to start is the audit that he mentioned earlier. And then executing on the map as accurately as you can and giving sales context around the content you're creating. And that's the key part here. You need to tell them why did you develop it? Who is it targeting? Why might prospects be interested in this content? Where, where might they access it? Where in the sales process is this content most beneficial? You need to keep all of this content with context in one place so that your sales team can find it, personalize it to the prospect, share it, and then give them the context around it so there's a, there's, there's a clear line through all of this, all from one location. And then so let's talk about that. You've done all of this legwork. You've done the audits. You've mapped out your personas. You've sat in on more sales meetings than you can probably care to mention at this point. And, and you, you developed all this content as a result. So you need to be able to get the most use out of it. And that's where we're going to talk about using content in different mediums. So while we're looking at preparing content, as we were just discussing, for the ease of use by your sales team, you need to be able to also leverage this content, all this content that you're creating, so your entire company can get the most life and value out of it. It's not uncommon that content has a very short lifetime. But that's because we as marketers tend to set it up this way. Most content is placed on a landing page, has a form thrown in front of it, has a campaign associated with it, gets mapped into Salesforce. That's probably about it. This content and its context are not translated to the sales team, or for that matter, anyone else in the company. And so it dies behind this form with a whimper. You see that initial shot, you get those leads in, and then it just kind of dies very quickly in half-lives. And so all of this, all this work that you've done isn't leveraged to its full extent. Minimally, it can be spun into a bunch of different mediums. Uh, you know, survey report, for example, can provide tweets, blog posts, Facebooks, LinkedIn posts, webinars, articles, and a whole lot more for quite some time. I'll show you an example of this. Uh, there's a company called ShapeUp that they did uh, an employee wellness report. So they went out and they surveyed all these uh, VPs of HR or wellness directors. 
and uh, they, they, they had them answer a bunch of questions for them, and then they issued this report. And it was the Shape Up Annual Employer Wellness Survey. Uh, and so what they did after they conducted the survey and they issued the results in this report, they set up a landing page on their website. That's what you see right here. And then they set up daily blog posts uh, and tweets to further explore the information. They, held a web they also held a webinar on the topic, did an infographic, and much more. You'll see as we click through here kind of just how all of this content came to life on their website and in other formats. They used one piece of content to get a lot of miles. And, and there are a lot of other examples out there from companies that do this really well. HubSpot's one that comes to mind. Uh, there's Nimble, Marketo. They, they take one piece of content and repurpose it in many different forms um, to be able to get a lot of life out of what they're doing. And the point is with this, use your time investment wisely and convey the message that you're trying to send in many different content mediums. Uh, not only does this uh, give you the chance to get the most out of the time you're investing, but it also gives you a lot more content that can cater uh, to different people in the process from one basic uh, piece of original content. But it isn't just using the same content across multiple mediums. Uh, you need to enable your entire company. We've talked a lot about sales and, and, and even account managers. They especially need to know what you're doing and you need to stay close to them um, and to the content you're creating. Uh, they need to know where it exists, where it's at, who it should be used with, and then have the, enti have the ability to easily share it in, in context. And this goes, by the way, for your entire company. Again, we're keeping it specific today, but everybody in your company should be your biggest advocates. It just so happens that sales, account managers, client services tend to be in front of people more often. And so as I mentioned, you have this early in the webinar, you, you have this entire army at your disposal. Many of us don't even take full advantage of them. And, and instead, we rely on our data and our marketing automation systems to try and personalize offerings. You're familiar with it, right? Hey, if you, if you clicked on this page, I'm going to send you this email. If you didn't click on that page, I'm going to send you another email. If you look at those emails, I'm going to send you a third email. You know how this kind of drip works and how convoluted it can get very quickly. The problem with this and the problem with relying on this approach is that we ignore, at the very least, at the very least, we don't enable those who are closest to our prospects and clients, and that's the sales and account management teams. So by analyzing the data, and, and I'm not arguing against that at all, it is hugely important. But by overanalyzing it, you're leaving out your sales and account management teams. And, and that's, the, I think, the key point is that we're all aligned in the same end goal here. Marketers, as, as much as salespeople, want to drive revenue that grows the company. Many reasons for this alignment, but the, 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 the sake of, of all our security in the future, it tends to be the, the best. Um, so why overlook this army at your disposal? You know, the army that knows your prospects best. They've been the ones talking with them on the phone, going back and forth over emails, chatting with them about what they did on the weekend. They start to learn about this prospect as a person, not just a lead record in your Salesforce database. And this is the army, these people that are learning about your prospects, that you need to educate and enable with your content. Yes, and, and so you know one of the things that is is absolutely critical as as you're engaging with this this sales team that's really in many ways your canary in the coal mine about your messages, um, is is that you have that feedback loop in place. You know, as as a person who creates software for a living, um, I get tremendous value out of getting early validation um, as soon as possible. You know, so I try to put together prototypes and wireframes well before I ever actually have a developer who's working on something so that I can get those in front of people and get validation. The same thing, um, you know, happens in marketing as well and, and can be leveraged through your sales team. Um, Sean talked about the importance of reuse. You know, the blog post of today is the foundation of the white paper of tomorrow, which is the foundation of the ebook, you know, uh, down the road. Well, before you get to that, you know, major effort of the ebook or the white paper, well, you know, taking advantage of that blog post and, and having your sales team leverage it, get feedback on it, and understand whether it's effective, um, is uh, is a hugely valuable. Right? It, it's difficult to hear, but that that canary in the coal mine, as as I like to think of it, um, really tells you if your content is being effective. It's it's important to isolate, is it the message or is it the medium? And, and especially when you're publishing and reusing content. So the earlier you can find out that that content or that message isn't working, the better. You know, as Sean said, obviously this is combined with other techniques such as analytics. Um, 
But this isn't just about finding out the effectiveness. This is also building up the faith and confidence of your sales team um, so that they feel confident using the artifacts, that they feel like the assets that they have in hand are the right one. So getting engaged with them, hearing, uh, making it clear that their voice is being heard um, only leads to more success, right? Sales is all about confidence, and so if they feel confident that the materials they have at hand, the more likely they are to be able to sell. Yeah, that was a really good uh, way to phrase it, Dan. I really like the product to uh, development team uh, um, comparison there. That, that, that's a really interesting way to look at this. Um, and so one, one more thing that will that, help kind of give us insight into this before we advance on to questions. So if you have any, you know, if there's anything you want to pick our brains about or ask us about all of this today, go ahead and type them in. But let's, let's, when setting up a feedback loop, um, as Dan was just talking about, other than the basics, one of the things I like doing best with my sales team is setting out a survey. And, and, you know, this is a little bit of an interesting way to get them to give you on the honest, candid feedback. And the survey will have questions like, why do clients choose us? What are the most common questions you were asked in the sales process? What objections do you hear? What do prospects, why do prospects choose competitors? And which one did they choose? Are you noticing any trends as a salesperson that you feel we as a company are not reacting to? And, and finally, if you could have anything, anything in the world from the marketing department that you feel would increase your lead to close ratio, what would it be and why? And so what all the answers to these questions do is not only do they give you great insight and feedback, and they tend to take out the kind of uh, team dynamic, the, the group think that might happen in sales meetings, um, but it's also effectively a SWOT analysis, and, and this helps you identify and order what content you're, you're lacking. Just like Dan talked about in the beginning, he did it with a heat map. Uh, that, that's, that's, that's another complimentary way to do the same thing. And something, doing something like this helps you more closely align with sales. You know, they'll, they'll feel like you're actually, to Dan's point earlier, listening to their input, um, that, that you're on the same team, that you're advancing towards the same goal. And to build on it, you have to be regimented. Make sure you sit in on at least some of the sales meetings. Um, listen in to some calls occasionally, if, if the sales team's willing to let you, and I'd be really surprised if they're not. And even attend prospect meetings if possible. Actually, if your sales team is uh, more than just an inside sales team, just go out there and meet with the prospects, sit in on the meetings, hear the kind of questions that are being asked so that you are hearing what the sales team's hearing and you can figure out how to adapt your messaging and content um, to, to be able to cater to that. And then talk to as many customers as you can. Um, once the deal is closed, uh, they're a great resource of information. Um, and all of this is very helpful in keeping you aligned and communicating with your sales team. So I guess in conclusion, you know, as I look at this, this overall challenge of making sure that your sales team is aligned uh, with uh, your marketing uh, and your content deliverables, you know, I, I really think of this in many ways like I think of sort of the traditional uh, presenter's mantra. Um, uh, you know, sales, sales is not always uh, going to, you're not always going to have their full attention, right? They're focused on deals and, and they're not focused on just, you know, how can you give me the best quality content. So I always like to think of it like that presenter's mantra, tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you told them. Um, as frequent engagement in conversations as you can have with sales about the quality of the content um, as you can have uh, is better. You're not always going to get that focused event where you're going to get all of the feedback all at one time. Um, you're probably going to get it in drips and drabs. So having those frequent ongoing conversations um, as well as all of the suggestions Sean had as far as engaging with prospects with them and uh, being part of the sales cycle with them uh, is only going to lead to better content. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Alexis. Great. Thank you, Dan and Sean. I really enjoyed that presentation. I definitely learned a lot as well. Um, you know, sitting next to sales every day, I definitely learned a few things, so thank you. Um, so we've had a fair amount of good questions asked um, from the audience, and I'm going to start off with this question for Sean. Um, what are the best ways to organize my content for sales enablement? Yeah, so that's one of the, uh, it, it could go a handful of ways, and it's one of the things we talked about you know, earlier in this presentation. 
Um, it, it, it's going to depend on your company and the way your sales currently finds information or, or um, uh, you know, kind of processes information. Typically, the ways that, that, that I'll say are, are some of the better ones, um, it could be around, there, there could be very easy ones around use case. So, for example, um, the types of users that might use your product or the roles, if there's multiple within an organization, um, you can organize it around that. Uh, as Dan talked about before, around, as, as, as you guys did a percussion, around uh, um, their, their spot in the sales funnel. Um, and then there's there's the easy way too, which is the this is an ebook, this is a webinar, this is you know all of those. Uh, I think the key point here is that it should be um, in whatever way that is easiest for your sales team to find and use, in a language that they will understand. And and the most important point that we um, emphasized a couple of times in this presentation with context. So uh, if it is just let's say let's keep it simple, these are all our ebooks. Um, if it's the context part, it'll say a note to your sales team. Uh, this is the ebook for very early in the funnel. This is the ebook for prospects that just came in off of this request. Uh, this is the ebook for after a demo. Um, give them things that will help them lead prospects through the cycle um, and know when to use what so that it's well tailored or better tailored uh, to what the prospect's looking for at that stage. Great, thank you, Sean. So, Dan, here's a question for you. Um, how do you address sales le leaders that don't understand content marketing? Well, um, I mean, I think you start by explaining what the what the uh, the foundation of it is, which is that sort of an informed customer is your best customer, right? That by building uh, a, your build content allows you to build a trust relationship. Um, with prospects, with uh, potential customers, um, and gets people engaged with you and your brand long before they may actually ever be ready to purchase. So, you know, from a pure sales mindset, it's it's about um, filling the funnel and providing uh, a, a funnel of people who are already interested in you as a vendor and as a thought leader. Um, so that's the most selfish way to explain it to them. Um, but I think you know the the more general way is to say yeah, this is a long term play. Um, this is about not not this isn't just about what we're going to close this quarter. This is about making sure there's a pipe for one, two, three, four quarters down the road. Um, and by by building up that trust relationship now, we reduce the sales cycle down the road and remove those sales barriers down the road. So that's how I would explain it to my sales leaders. Great, thank you, Dan. Um, so, Sean, this is a question that I have for you. Um, I'd love to hear what questions that I, I should ask the sales force. For example, what what do they need? What are some other questions you would ask the sales force? Yeah, so this is something that we covered a bit during the SWOT analysis slide, um, and this is something I kind of do a little. Um, uh, Sarah's typically, yeah, Sarah's typically. I can't pronounce it right now. I apologize, but I do this a little bit undercover by asking um, Sarah's typically, why do clients choose us? What are the most common questions you are asked in the sales process? What objections do you hear? What prospects? Um, why do prospects choose competitors? So why are you losing deals? And which ones do they choose? Are you noticing any trends that you feel as a company where you're not reacting to? Um, those kind of questions are what give you an analysis and, and a little bit of an insight into what your sales team's thinking um, and gives you their honest, candid feedback, especially, again, if the reason I like doing this by a survey, um, and then, you know, I, I also do sit around sales meetings and, and other events to stay close to them, but I like this one for a survey because it, it removes the group think and what it will let you identify as you ask those and see the answers to them. Um, is is where are they honing in around? So what are the key points that you're hearing across the board? Is there a single piece of content that they're all typically looking for? Are you losing out to a, 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 a common competitor, you know, a competitor on a commonality um, for, for, for similar reasons? Um, you know, those are the kind of things that will allow you to develop content that, that positions your company a bit better, helps you cater to the prospects, and, and gives the sales team what they're looking for as well. That's great, thank you. Um, so, Dan, I have a question for you. Can you talk more about the content heat map or content map that you did and how you went about identifying the gaps? Yeah, sure. Um, it, was, it was, as I said, we first we started with um, identifying all of the stages in our sales cycle. 
Um, and, and as I said, we included everything before MQL. So if we had stages uh, uh, you know, that we kind of considered as part of our lead generation process. Uh, and then we looked at all of the different buyer personas that we're targeting, whether they are um, the decision makers. In our case, we have a difference between uh, sometimes between the decision maker, the person who has budget authority, and the people who are doing the initial research. So we had those different personas defined. Um, and from there, once we had that, that grid, uh, we went and plugged in the assets that we already had. Um, you know, some assets could be used for multiple personas, multiple stages, um, and at the result, at the end, uh, and then we, we um, also overlaid sort of the aging content, how old something was, so we kind of flagged things that were, that we knew were out of date and needed to be updated. And we stepped back and looked at that, and it became very clear, like, where we had gaps. Um, and from there, then we were able to work with the sales team and say, okay, these are the gaps, we have a hypothesis on which of these are the most important, but we'd like to hear your feedback. So we didn't go in fully baked with this is what we're going to do next. We went, we heard their feedback on what they thought we should prioritize, and, and, that's, what, uh, and, and that's where our, our plan of attack came out of that. So that, that heat map really was a combination of the persona, the, uh, the, the stale, sales cycle, the assets we had, and how out of date or not those assets were. Great, thank you. Um, so Sean, uh, this is your final question. Um, how do you suggest using content marketing to grab the attention of sales in a highly matrixed organization that sells more than just your product? Okay, so I'm going to have to try to go for a little insight there into because I'm not 100% certain what they're asking. So highly matrixed meaning um, probably more than just product, you're selling services around it. If I'm wrong here, go ahead and type in. But how to use content marketing to grab the, the, the sales team's attention for um, different offerings that you might have? Um, I, I don't think it's terribly dissimilar. Uh, I think what you might be asking, if I'm reading into this a little bit, is, is if there's something that's not a key offering, that if they make their money, to Dan's point about being coin-operated, off of something that is very... Um, transactional, something that they sell a lot and you're trying to get their focus on another thing, that can be tough if that's what you're asking. Uh, and so what I would show there is that's where you have to start to analyze data. Are there complementary ways to get them to also sell it? Um, and that's kind of the easy way in is, hey, there's, there's, there's a chance for you to sell this as well. Um, we have the, the content marketing set up for it, assuming you do. Um, if not, that's probably a good start is you're bringing in leads that are looking for that. And then it's, it's a natural thing that if you're bringing in leads that way, they're going to want to hear about that service. So while the salespeople might be focused on something else, to show them that, that there's an easy path through your content marketing, through the, the materials that you have defined, through the way that you're bringing leads in and where they're coming from, there's an easy path to close there as well. I think that's probably the challenge that you run into. So set up that material, get it mapped well um, if, it's, if it's beneficial for your company, uh, and, and, you know, cater it to the process. Loop your sales team in then. As leads come in from there, they're not going to want to hear about the other service. They're going to want to hear about that. Um, and hopefully everything kind of uh, um, uh, jives there, if I'm understanding the problem correctly. Hopefully everything jives there with the main product they're selling. But if I didn't, again, if I didn't answer that properly, feel free to, uh, to, to ask it again or feel free to email me as well. It's sean at postwire.com. Yeah, Sean, this is Dan. I'm going to jump in with uh, some of my experience with that as well. Uh, when I worked at Taleo, we had that kind of matrix organization where we had um, multiple uh, products that the sales team had available, multiple tiers of uh, service level, multiple uh, 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 multiple uh, um, uh, organization size. So we were segmenting by by multiple different dimensions with leadership and oversight um, across many of those dimensions. So a given sales leader might be you know, having to focus on uh, uh, a broad um, segment um, of uh, a broad segment based on on company size, where another sales leader might be focused exclusively on a product line. And so, for us, the real challenge there was education um, in the cross uh, in the cross selling, so that they had an area that they were focused on, that they cared about, that they cared about the content. 
And so, you know, we had that map for them of the content they, they really cared about. Um, and then when they had to loop in other teams, other leaders, other, um, and provide other information to their prospects in areas outside of their focus, that's when they really needed the education that said, this is why they care about this, this is, yeah, and this, these are the assets. So there ended up being a lot of education in that environment as well. Great. Thank you, Dan. Um, so this is a final question for Dan and Sean. Um, Sean, I'll let you go first. Um, so as you know, the marketing industry changes every single minute, and you know, um, content marketing changes every single minute. What, where do you think are the best places to stay abreast on the topic of content marketing, digital marketing, web marketing, social marketing? Um, Sean? Sure. So there's a couple great areas um, out there that I typically turn to every day. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, there's there's uh, Marketing Profs, which every day puts out an email with a couple of topics, some thought leadership pieces every now and again, some of their own around uh, what's hot in content marketing. Um, HubSpot and Marketo have great blogs, great Twitter feeds, uh, and pump out information all the time. Um, even Content Marketing Institute. Uh, is also a really good uh, resource. Their their conference is even coming up soon. Um, there's there's really if if you start to dig into it, probably you know a handful of similar type of places that you can find that information. But those are the ones that I really like to use to kind of stay up on topics. Um, and the best is always to um, have a really strong peer group. Um, you know, it's or a really strong network, however you want to phrase it. But other people like you that go through similar problems or have already gone through those problems that you can talk to, because uh, those are also great people to learn from um, and see what the newest trends are. And of course, our webinars. So you know, feel free to come back here and learn as well. Yeah, I, I, Sean, those are great sources uh, for me. I, the ones I would, uh, the, what I would add on top of that is, um, uh, Curata just came out with this great list of of all of these different content marketing vendors um, because there are so many. It's a very broad topic. There are a lot of different vendors that do different things. Um, and I kind of have an aggregated Twitter feed, a list that I, um, I'm always trying to keep up with all of those different vendors and what's going on with them. So that's another source is just knowing who the, the players are and following them. But I think another area that I think is evolving um, is a little bit more mainstream interest in content marketing. Um, for example, if you think about uh, people that are very focused on usability, like um, Luke uh, W. I'm going to butcher his last name, Robolewski, um, uh, the the blog A List Apart, um, user experience uh, effectiveness, uh, Karen McGrain. These are all people that have been leaders in usability that have become very interested in content marketing and content first. Uh, and I think that they provide an interesting perspective on on content and how to effectively communicate using content. So I think that's another dimension that's evolved um, that that I like to keep up uh, up to date with, and I think uh, might be interesting to some people. Great, thank you, gentlemen. I think that concludes today's webinar. Thank you for everybody who attended. We appreciate your time. The slides will be emailed to you post webinar. And if you don't, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us at Percussion or at Postwire. Thank you for your time. <laughs>